You know, I, I told many of you before that years ago, I received an email from a guy who visited our church for the very first time. And this happens every now and then. Someone will come and visit and they'll just send me an email just kind of wanting me to know about their experience. And so he, that's what he was doing. And he wanted me to know, and he was real kind of upfront with this. He wanted me to know, I don't believe what you believe. He was like, I just want you to know that. I'm not sure I buy all this Jesus stuff. I'm not sure about the Bible. I don't know about any of this kind of stuff. He's like, but I'm open. I'm open at least. He said, I'm not there yet with the whole belief stuff, but he goes, here's what I want you to know. And here's what was undeniable, he said, about being at LCBC, being with the people at LCBC this weekend. And this is the sentence he wrote that I've never let go of. He said, your love is easy to see. And I just highlighted that sentence and I just kind of captured it. And I, because that statement right there, it just kind of lodged itself into my heart as a vision for what our church should always be. That when anyone, regardless of what they've done, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they've been, regardless of their past, regardless of what they believe or don't believe, that when anyone walks through our doors, we want them to be overwhelmed by the love that they sense in this place, don't we? You know, smiles make our love easy to see. Listening patiently to someone's story makes our love easy to see. Opening doors. Letting someone go before us, that makes our love easy to see. Giving up our seat makes our love easy to see. Meeting someone in the atrium on the way out and then trading numbers to connect later because you found out they're new in town, that makes our love easy to see. Encouraging someone who's discouraged makes our love easy to see. Praying for someone who's going through it makes our love easy to see. But it's not just what's happening inside of these walls that matters most to us. We, we want our love to be easy to see wherever we go, don't we? outside of the walls of this place. We want our communities to be different because our love is easy to see outside of the walls of the church. This is why we made a decision a long time ago as a church that we were gonna do whatever we could to find strategic partner organizations all across our state who are doing exceptional work with the poor and under-resourced, who are serving the sick, who are providing shelter for those who need it, who are giving dignity to the elderly and homebound who are working with children with developmental and physical needs. And, and we decided as a church, we're not gonna compete with these organizations. We're not competitors. We wanna partner with these organizations. They're already doing exceptional work. We just wanna come alongside them. And you know, we don't have a ton of traditions here at our church, but one tradition we've kind of developed over the years is that we just set aside time in the fall to focus our attention on our communities by simply asking, what can we do right now? What can we do as a church to unleash a flood of generosity and love and compassion and good works on those in our community who might be in need right now? And how can we come alongside our nonprofit partners around the state and around the world to help them go further faster? And you know, over the years, man, it's amazing to me. You, you guys amaze me. You really do. It's amazing to see what's happened over the years. You know, over the years that we've been focusing on making our love easy to see, let me just tell you what you've done. This is what you've done. You've given just under $5 million to our local partners that I just talked about. That money right there has been used to, for some of them, renovate, renovate and expand their facilities, launch new programs to serve people, buy transportation, buy vans that they need in order to run their programs. It's done so much. That's what you've given. You know, over the years now, you've served 32,000 hours with these local partners. Did you say, how can we give you some manpower? 53,000 or 53,000 21 Operation Christmas child shoe boxes have gone out to children all over the world, which is absolutely amazing. 35,931 giving tree gifts. That means there's children all across our state who would not have gotten a Christmas because their families couldn't have afforded one, but you were able to provide the gifts for that. And by the way, here's the best part. You don't get the credit. Their parents get the credit when those kids open up those gifts. You know how dignifying that is for you to give that to those parents? Last one is 7,060 children are sponsored through you, through this church. That's what you're a part of. That's what I want you to know. That's what you're a part of. Your love is easy to see. And so I shouldn't be surprised by this. I mean, you know, it's kind of just who you are. But man, I'm telling you, over the last couple of weeks again, you've stepped up again. 
And I know it shouldn't shock me because that's just your character, but over the last couple of weeks, you've taken thousands more Operation Christmas, shoe, uh, Christmas Child shoe boxes. You're, you're filling up slots for you and your families and your, you know, or maybe you and your group to go serve at our partner organizations in the coming weeks. There's more slots available. If you go online, you can find them. And then last weekend, you gave hundreds of thousands of dollars. In one weekend, hundreds of thousands of dollars. There were lines of people waiting to give. Every penny of that is gonna be given to our nonprofit partners across the state. If you missed out on that opportunity to give last weekend, you can all Always jump online on our website, just click on the easy to see banner and you can give today. But here, here's what I love. See, this is what I love most about this season. You really don't even have to be religious to get on board with this effort to make our love easy to see in our community. Some of you are here today and you're skeptical or you're new and you don't know what you believe about any of this Jesus, Bible, God stuff. But listen, if your motivation to give to these efforts and to serve these nonprofit partners, if your motivation is simply to just be a good neighbor, to be a good citizen, just be charitable, hey, that's good enough. Jump in because People are gonna be helped as a result. But, and this is a big one, but if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're here today and you would say that you're a, you are a life changed by Christ, I mean, the reason why we do everything we can to make our love easy to see, the reason that we give, the reason that we serve, it is rooted in something so much bigger, so much deeper than just we wanna be nice people. It's way bigger than that. It's so much bigger than just we just need to do our duty as good citizens. The reason we do this is because we follow a savior, a king, a new commanding officer named Jesus who made his love easy to see in ways that were almost unimaginable. You know, time and time again in the New Testament writings, you read that Jesus, here's the quote, was moved with compassion. You read this over and over again. He reached out and he touched people with leprosy. No one did this. You were considered ceremonially, ritually unclean if you touched someone with a skin disease and Jesus would touch them. He could have healed them by just saying the word. He didn't do that. He was willing to do what no one else was willing to do to make his love easy to see. He shared meals with people who were known to be thieves and prostitutes. He fed hungry people on a hillside why? Because he was moved with compassion. You can't read the New Testament writings without coming to the undeniable conclusion that Jesus was moved by the broken, the discarded, the lost, the people that everyone else would move away from, Jesus moved towards. And then, after his followers had witnessed this kind of radical love for all people, Jesus made this absolutely revolutionary statement at one point to his followers. This is what he said. This is in John chapter 13. He said, your love, your love for one another, well, that's gonna be what proves to the world that you are my disciples. Disciples just mean my followers. You wanna know how the world will know that you're affiliated with me, that you're mine? <clears throat> he said, it'll be your love. What kind of love, Jesus? Well, the same kind of love that, that I've been showing you that moves towards the broken and the discarded. The kind of love that sacrifices for those in need. The kind of extravagant love that they had just witnessed him live out in front of their eyes. Now let me tell you why this is so inspiring to a simple guy like me. See, I'm a simple kind of guy. And Jesus says, let me make it real simple for you. If you wanna know, if you want people to know that you follow me, that you love God, that you're all in with me, it's not gonna be demonstrated on how educated you are, thank God. How much Bible you can recite from memory. How, how you dress. How perfect morally you are. He's like, those are not bad things. He's just saying, look, that's not gonna be the proof. It's real simple. The greatest demonstration to the world that you love God will be how well you love others. Kind of simple. And it just simplifies, simplifies things for me in a world that feels like it's gone off the rails every now and then. Do you guys agree with that, by the way? Every now and then you look at the world, you're like, what? People lost their dang minds, man. <laughs> and every now and then when it just feels like the world's gone off the rails, man, this just brings me back to the heart of it. Because look, I don't need, here's what it means for me and it means for you. I don't need to figure out, we don't need to figure out how God's gonna work everything out. I don't know how God's gonna work everything out. What I need to do, what we need to do is wake up every day and be faithful to loving 
the people right in front of us. And Jesus' first followers, they took Jesus real seriously when he said these words. And it changed the world. It changed the world. Somewhere around the year 160, an epidemic broke out in the Roman Empire. And by the way, can you have church and not bring up the Roman Empire? Like, have we really had church if we don't bring up the Roman Empire? Come on, men. All right. So this epidemic breaks out in the Roman Empire. Most scholars today believe it, uh, believe it was smallpox. And estimates are that it killed up to one-third of the population. I mean, you look around the room right now, wherever you are, one out of every three people you're looking at, gone. There was a particularly famous physician at the time, his name was Galen, who lived in Rome, the epicenter of the epidemic. Now, a physician who had some skill sets in this particular moment would be valuable, right? He could help in this particular moment. The problem is, is that Galen was nowhere to be found. In fact, what we know from history is that Galen hightailed it. He, he hightailed it to his country estate in Asia Minor until the epidemic subsided. Just ghosted everyone in their time of greatest need. But here's why I'm telling you this. Here's the fascinating thing. No one was upset by this. It really didn't make any waves. There's no historical evidence that anyone was upset by this. It didn't cause any waves at the time that the person who could help was gone. In fact, it was viewed as wise, as prudent, as smart. It's what everyone with means would do in that situation, right? Well, I guess everyone except one particular group of people who were living at Rome, in Rome at that time. Because we know from history there was this one group of people who had oriented their life around one that they believed to be the Son of God, their Savior, named Jesus. And this group, they stayed. And they served. They served their neighbors when everyone else discarded them. In fact, we know from historical record that many of them died themselves because of their unique commitment to love others sacrificially. Now, the real question is this, why? Why would they stay? Why not retreat? Why not huddle up and play it safe? Why risk so much in order to serve? And I would imagine that somewhere down deep in their hearts, they had these words of Jesus rattling around in them that he had spoken not too many years before this epidemic. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 25. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me a drink and I was a stranger, I was lonely, you took me in to your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick. And you cared for me. I was in prison. And you visited me. Now, I don't know about you, but, but you know, if Jesus ever spoke these words to me, at some point, maybe you feel the same way, I'm gonna scratch my head and be like, oh, that's nice. Um, hey, real quick, I don't remember ever seeing you hungry, Jesus. <laughs> I don't remember any of this. I don't remember seeing you thirsty. I don't remember seeing you sick, making you some soup. By the way, my soup, probably make you sicker. You don't want it. But I don't remember any of this, Jesus. I don't remember the last time I saw Jesus in any of these conditions. Do you? And I think Jesus anticipates that we're going to feel this way because what Jesus says next, whew, game changer. He says this, I tell you the truth. When you did any of those things I just talked about, if you did it, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, well, you were doing it to me. It was me on the other side. What do you see when you look at people? What do you see when you look at someone else? Let me ask another way. What do you see when you look at people who are in situations that are worse than yours. Can we just talk real for a second? Every now and then, this kind of thought goes through my mind. Well, they probably deserve it. Probably deserve it. I don't know how they ended up there, but I'm sure they probably deserve it. They brought it upon themselves. 
or maybe this one every now and then. Well, I'm glad I'm not like that. Glad I haven't ended up there. See, I don't know. Again, real talk here. I'm sure I'm the only one who feels this way. Maybe, I don't know. But it's a bit easier to demonstrate and act in love towards someone who didn't bring it on themselves. It's a bit more challenging to act in love towards those who ended up where they have because of their own dumb choices. And yet, do not miss this. And yet, Jesus doesn't put conditions on this, does he? Jesus doesn't nuance who's worthy of love and care. We don't know if they were hungry because of choices they made or maybe a famine which they had no control over swept the land. We don't know how they ended up hungry. We don't know if they were in prison because of a horrible life choice they made or because some injustice against them. We don't know how they ended up there. We don't know if they were sick, why they were sick. And Jesus says how they ended up, how people end up in the position that they are in doesn't really matter. He doesn't nuance who's deserving of our love and care. Jesus is saying, the closer that you draw to the heart of Jesus, the closer that you draw to my heart, Jesus is saying to us, you will find your heart opening up more and more to unconditionally loving everyone around you. In particular, people that others would have discarded and been done with a long time ago, the sick, the lonely, the poor, the prisoners. And this is the conviction that these first followers of Jesus lived with, and it is a conviction that still drives us today, and it's this. Here's the easiest way to say it. The most appropriate response to the extravagant love of God is to love others extravagantly. Bottom line, the most appropriate response to the extravagant love of God is to love others extravagantly. You're like, I just don't know how to express my gratitude for everything that God has done for me. Love others in the same way. Or as one of the very first followers of Jesus named John said it, we love because he first loved us. In light, it's almost like saying, look, in light of the limitless love of God that we have received in Christ, in light of the reality that Jesus Christ poured out his love on us with no strings attached, you know that, right? He loves you with no strings attached. There's no conditions on his love. In light of the reality that we have done nothing to deserve his infinite grace and generosity, you know that, right? You don't deserve his love, neither do I. And yet he freely gives it to us. You've done nothing to earn it. I know who I am and I know what I deserve and it is not his love. And in light of all that, it's almost like Jesus saying, who are we to withhold it from others? And this idea caught the world on fire in a world where people ran away from the least of these to their country estates, these first followers of Jesus ran towards them. And this is what caught the eye of a a world waiting to see the love of God displayed. This is what changed the world. In fact, a writer from the third century, he made this observation about the way in which Christians responded to those that others had discarded. His name was Tertullian. Please name your next child that, or, or don't. You don't want them to get picked on, but there you go. Here's what Tertullian said. He said, it's our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us. That's an interesting phrase. We'll come back to that in a second. In the eyes of many of our opponents, people who don't even believe what we believe, they're seeing the way that we love each other and listen to what they're saying. They're saying, only look, they say, look how they love one another. He's saying that as early as the first couple centuries of the church, the distinguishing, defining mark of followers of Jesus, the defining characteristic that caught the attention of everyone, even atheists, even people who didn't believe what what Christians believe, even those opposed to Christianity, it was undeniable that their love was easy to see. And I love the idea that Tertullian puts out about, it was the brand of Christians, it was Loving kindness that branded Christians. In other words, that was their reputation. This is what they were known for. Man, don't you want that true for our church, that we continue to be a church? That the first thing that would come to people's minds when they think of us would be, man, look how loving they are. I don't know if I believe what they believe. I think they're kind of crazy for that whole resurrection. I think they're kind of crazy for the whole Jesus stuff. But one thing I can't deny, man, they are the most loving people I think I've been around. Wouldn't that be good? And you know, one of the questions that kind of haunts me related to this, keeps me up at night. I got weird things that go through my head. This is one of them. You don't want to be in my head. Not for even a minute. 
This is the kind of stuff that goes through my head every now and then as I just think about our church and I think about our campuses and I'm like, man, if our campuses, if our church disappeared tomorrow, like boom, Thanos snaps, we're gone. Would our community even notice? Like, like would Wyoming Missing and Sinking Spring, would they even notice if tomorrow campus is gone there? Would Waynesboro even know? Would Ephrata know? If our church just wasn't there tomorrow, would they know because it would be so undeniable that we have made a dent in that community because we are people who made our love easy to see and they would go, man, some, there's a vacuum of love now. Where did that go? Let's make this more personal. If you were to leave your school tomorrow, would your classmates feel a vacuum of kindness and love because you're not there? If you were to leave your place of work tomorrow, would your coworkers, would your team at work, would they sense a void of loving kindness because you're not there? If you were to move, would your neighbors feel a vacuum of love and kindness on the street because you're gone? I was hungry and you fed me. I was lonely and you sat with me. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. When, Jesus? When did that ever happen? When you decided to move in love towards those that everyone else had discarded. He said, you did it for me. A few months ago, we started thinking about groups of people in our state who have been discarded at times that our church could show up for in this season. And it struck us, a team of people started thinking about this, and it struck us that Jesus talked specifically about prisoners in Matthew 25, didn't he? It's the last thing he said. So we just started getting on the phone with some prisons around the state asking, hey, look, we don't know where this is going, but is there anything our church could do to make our love easy to see for the people in your prison or for the men and women who are serving time in your prisons? Do you know that some of the directors of these correctional facilities and prisons started crying on the phone because they have never had anyone ask how they could serve and love the people in those facilities? And we were told that there were a ton of restrictions as to what we could or couldn't send into the prisons. No food, it's good, we are gonna send that anyways. Again, you don't want my soup. Nothing with staples, nothing with tape, no QR codes, don't really get that one, but no QR codes. And you can't say anything overtly religious. But, it, but with as many restrictions as we had, we decided, man, we're not gonna let that stop us. We knew that we could create something to send to the prisons that would speak hope into the people's lives. And I love what our team came up with. And so we're gonna do something in a moment we've never done before as a church. Never done this. Every single one of you is going to have an opportunity today to pack what we're calling hope packs for prisoners all across our state. In fact, this weekend, we're gonna pack about 12,000 of these bags. You're gonna pack them. You're gonna get a chance to pack one for the men and women who are incarcerated. And then we're uh, uh, packing an additional 2,500 for correctional officers working in those facilities. Many of the prisons that we're gonna be sending these to are located in the same regions as our campuses. And in just a moment, you're gonna have an opportunity to pack one hope pack of your own that is gonna be sent to an inmate. But I wanted to take a moment and tell you what you're gonna be packing in your bag, and then we're gonna roll up our sleeves and get to work. A couple of things that we're gonna be packing or the things we're gonna be packing that I just wanna point out and, and, and almost tell you why we landed on these things. The first is just a couple of these. They're, they're, they're just fun little things. This one is actually a would you rather. It's like a card, like a would you rather game. Um, and so they've got different versions. Like would you rather be stuck on an island alone or with someone who talks incessantly? How many of you guys would rather be with someone who talks all the time? Good. You're the people I don't wanna be stuck with. So let me just, <laughs> let me look real quick, Okay. Just fun, something that we've got, we're gonna give them like a Pennsylvania, trivia about Pennsylvania, just a fun little trivia thing. Like for instance, like where's the, where's the oldest gas station in the US? 
Now, I asked our staff this this week, and they're like, Pennsylvania. I was like, guys, duh, it's Pennsylvania trivia. What town? <laughs> what town? It's Altoona. First gas station ever, Altoona. Now, here's the thing. Why would we give them these kinds of things? You wanna know why? We wanna foster relationships. We wanna do what we can to foster connection points. And what's real fun is we're sending these same things, different versions to the correctional officers. How cool is that to think that we might be able to foster some relational connections between even the officers and the prisoners as well? We're gonna send them, um, you're gonna be able to pack a word search. Um, Here's why, things that we take for granted to fill our time are not afforded to many of the men and women who are inmates. They can't mindlessly scroll through a phone and so we wanna provide activity for them, kind of simple. Um, We're gonna provide and you're gonna pack a journal for them. I love this one. Because we wanna provide, for those who want it, who receive this, we wanna provide the opportunity to reflect. The opportunity to write prayers. You know that the book of Psalms and the scriptures is is just written down prayers. How cool is that to think that there's gonna be someone who might for the very first time write out their prayers to God about what God, or reflect on what God might be doing in their life and to give them their own space to do that. You're gonna provide and you're gonna be able to pack for them a calendar. Now let me tell you what I love most about this calendar. It's not even about the calendar. It's what's on the back because on the back, we've actually given them three stories of life change. of people here at our church, these are stories we've shared. And here's why this is so meaningful. Don't we want them to know that change is always possible? That God can always do something new in our life? that nobody is too far gone, nobody is too far gone, that God cannot reach into our hearts and change us with his limitless forgiveness. And we just want them to know that. And then we're gonna provide for them just some inspiring words. And we've got a bookmark that has some quotes on it that they can have. And then there's this little card. And on this little card, it just says, you are loved, you are seen, you are valued. And here's what we know, right? Words have the power of life and death. That's what Proverbs 18, 21 says. We can speak words of life into someone. We wanna speak words of life. Our church wants to show up, make our love easy to see by speaking words of life into them. We want the truth of who God says they are to replace the negative soundtracks that so many of them have been given. And here's what's real cool about this little card right here on this little You Are Love note card. Um, You'll notice when you turn it over on the back that it's blank and it has this little blank slot and it just says, this was prepared with care by, and that's a place for you to personalize it and write your name. Just write your name. Just sign your name there. There should be pens in your seats around you um, or maybe that you got on the way in, share pens if you need to. But I wanna stress this, you gotta listen to this. I was told I've got to stress this. You cannot write anything other than your name. No notes, no Bible reference, nothing, all right? Just, you know, no like, hey, what's it like? I mean, you can't do that, all right? If you feel like you can't control yourself on this, skip this one, all right? Like if you're like, I just gotta write something, don't. Just skip this one, this part. And here's why. See, these prisons, to be honest, they feel like they are taking a massive risk by letting us do this. They, they've never done, they don't do this. And they feel like they're taking a risk by letting so much come in like this and we don't wanna do anything to jeopardize the relationships that we're building with these institutions right now, okay? So only your name. These are small things. There's not a lot that's real flashy about it. These are small things. In fact, when the team came a couple months ago, we're like, so here's what we're thinking, and they kind of laid all this out. I was like, really? That's it? A calendar? Some stories of life change? A card reminding them of who God says they are? Some activities to pass time to connect with others? But here's how God challenged my heart. They're small things, but here's what I know, man. I know that God is more than able to do big things with our small things that we give him. I know that God is more than able to work with the small things that we just say, God, do something with this, please. Recently, I received an email with a story of one of our families here at LCBC who they've walked through some really tough stuff recently. And the woman who wrote this email let me know that her husband is currently serving a sentence at a state prison. However, she wanted me to know how God has been working in his life in new and fresh ways. And she wanted to tell me one story in particular that put this on display, and it is a story about a gift 
that her husband gave to another inmate named Joe. I'm changing his name. We're just gonna call him Joe for this story. A gift that he wanted to give him on his birthday. And so I just wanna read you. I'm just gonna read you. I, I can't say it any better than she says in this email. I wanna read you what she wrote me. She said, my husband recently remembered that it was Joe's birthday. There isn't a lot of gift giving that can occur in, in a prison. However, my husband keeps some extra commissary items in his locker so that he can give out something special on birthdays. He selected a honey bun. Yes. He selected a honey bun from the locker and he closed the door. But immediately, he just felt prompted to reopen the locker door. My husband hesitated for a moment, but he opened the locker door again and he saw two boxes of junior mints staring at him from the top shelf. Now, the top shelf is where the good things are, the things my husband loves, the products that are easily accessible from the top bunk where he spends a fair amount of his time. And so he paused for a moment before reaching in and taking out both boxes of junior men's because when God nudges, we listen. He placed the honey bun he replaced the honey bun and then proceeded to walk over to Joe's foot locker and he placed both boxes of junior mints in Joe's locker and then my husband walked back to his bunk not thinking much about it. Just a few minutes later, Joe came over and gave him a huge hug. Parentheses, that's not common in prison, FYI. <laughs> my husband was shocked with the response but returned the hug and with tears in his eyes, Joe looked at my husband and asked, why did you give me those junior mints? My husband replied, it's your birthday. Still shocked, Joe said, yeah, yeah, but why did you choose the junior mints? And why two boxes? And my husband said, I just knew that that was what I was supposed to give you. Joe looked baffled and then explained, I've been in prison for 19 years. And every year for my birthday, my mom sends me two boxes of junior mints. And she died eight months ago. And you didn't know any of that. <laughs> and my husband smiled and replied, I didn't, but God did. You have no clue how God will use the little things like junior mints, a calendar, a note card. You have no clue what it may mean to someone on the other side. I actually talked to a guy this week who's a part of our church and used to be in prison and I was telling him about this and he told me that there are men and women, he was like, undoubtedly, Jason, 100%, there are men and women who are gonna receive these hope packs. It will be the only thing they have received from the outside all year. 